Colleen. All right. So we're going to talk about eating and feeding disorders. Now, this will be a big portion of your test. Schizophrenia, bipolar, eating and feeding disorders are huge on this exam. All right. What, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to uh, do a general assessment. You're going to do vital signs, system, general appearance, all of that. The thing about it is, is we got to be able to recognize an eating disorder and recognize what it is. Okay. So we're going to give them a good assessment. Look at the problem. What's their chief complaint? Obviously, sometimes we can see it, what value they attach to their body. When we're doing our, uh, our assessment, we're going to find out a lot about how they feel about their body shape and their weight, right? And then we're going to look at their eating habits, their fluid intake, um, what do they want to achieve? And then we're going to look at binging and purging. So be aware, I'm going to help you decide the difference between anorexia and bulimia. There, I think on the other notes, uh, there are uh, like a box that shows maybe anorexia and bulimia and wants you to compare them. So just be aware. The big thing with feeding or eating disorders is going to be some electrolyte levels, all right? Uh, you're going to see changes in electrolytes, glucose, maybe even some thyroid functioning tests, uh, and then a complete blood count, and maybe even some heart, uh, a heart, you know, uh, e ECG. Now, first of all, somebody, does somebody, can somebody tell me what is anorexia? Somebody want to share it? It's when the, they don't have adequate intake. Okay. Okay. Yes, I was like, so what it is, is they are not eating, right? That's what an anorexia is. Well, the word anorexia means they're, they're not hungry, but, uh, or not eating. And, but we have uh, something that has now gone beyond just the normal, I don't want to eat, right? It's persistent energy intake restriction leading to significantly low body weight in the context of age, sexual development, and physical health. So they're not eating enough calories to make energy. They have a very low body weight. Their BMI will be very low. What is the problem that this person has? They actually are afraid of becoming fat. They're afraid of gaining weight. That's their problem. Okay. They have a disturbance in how they perceive their self. They perceive their self as fat, even though they're bone thin. There's a, I don't know if any of you guys have seen, there's a girl on the internet. Uh, I just ran across it one day. She's super anorexic, but she kind of like promotes herself that way. And they do have a disturbed perceived image of their self. Uh, two subs, there's two subtypes here, restricting and then binge eating. Sometimes uh, anorexia is the restriction portion where they don't allow their self to eat. And there are some other things, other factors that may be playing a role in this person's life. They could be bipolar, they could have depression, they could have anxiety, and then maybe comes out as an eating disorder. Um, this, what they're finding sometimes is there may be some altered serotonin function, uh, but here, I want to highlight this. I want you to write this one down. They're perfectionist. They want to be perfect, and that is their problem, and sometimes the instructor will like to ask you, what is their problem? It's perfectionism. They're obsessive, or they maybe have obsessive compulsion compulsion but these people are generally perfectionists um so what we want to see is what what are their thoughts and what are their physical findings okay so we know that anorexics are perfectionist they actually are terrified of gaining weight they have a preoccupation with food they constantly think about food now you wouldn't think so because they're so skinny and they don't eat, but they're constantly thinking, don't let that food touch my mouth. They have obsessive intrusive thoughts, a view of self as fat, even when they're emaciated. When they look in the mirror, they see fat, even though there's just bone. They have a peculiar handling of food. What you'll see an anorexic do is they will sit down and they will cut their food into small pieces and kind of push it around the plate and then it make it look like they're doing something, right? Uh, possible uh, 
rigorous exercise. So I'll tell you when my kids were young, I wish I was still going to the gym, but I, I'm not. But when I did go to the gym, there was this young girl there and she was there when I got there. And then later that evening, I went back for something and she was there still running on the treadmill. She was bone thin and they will do this rigorous exercise. And that was the first time I realized that she might be anorexic. So they actually can induce vomiting, but we're going to keep induction of vomiting with a bulimic okay uh, but they'll tend to use laxatives and diuretics also sometimes a bulimic becomes anorexic and anorexic can become bulimic so you got to know the difference between them uh, their cognition is so disturbed that the individual judges their self-worth by their weight so they feel like if they can keep their self under control and skinny and they're worth, they're worth something. So remember, there's anxiety and depression that's involved in this. So if I was going to ask you, what would be some important facts about anorexia? What would you tell me? Somebody tell me something. I know y'all are on here. You want to share it? Maybe what? Terror of gaining weight. They're absolutely terrified of that maybe they see their self as fat when they're not and how they handle their food that's important these are important facts for your test so be aware that they tend to exercise crazy now with an anorexic just know that they are going to have some electrolyte disturbances and I think there's a little a section we may come across on this one that will show what they are but I want you to see headaches, fainting, dizziness, mood swings, anxiety, depression. Um, they have dry skin and lips, brittle nails, thin hair, bruise easily, uh, a yellow complexion. They have some lanugo. Now that's important where they have that fine hair uh, on their body and they have some intolerance to cold. Uh, they get very cold. Obviously, they don't have any fat on their body. But look, they have poor circulation, cold extremities. They might even have some heart arrhythmias, which is important. Increase or decreased heart rate. But what is pancytopenia? Tell me what that is, somebody. Pancytopenia is important in this disease. Anybody know? Okay. If you don't know, I want you to think everything is thrown into the pan. Low white blood cells, low red blood cells, low platelets. Everything is down, okay? That's called pancytopenia. They also have low levels of iron, and they also can have constipation, probably because they're not getting any fiber or fluids either. So um, women will often have or lose their period, which is amenorrhea. And look here, dehydration, decreased kidney function, and then they also have some loss of bone and calcium. They're just totally deficient in their nutrients because they're really not eating. And um, so we worry about osteoporosis and bone density. Osteopenia means softening of the bone, okay? So they might have some of these things here. So let's look, what are you gonna do? You are now the mental health nurse. And so we're going to, um, try to immediately stabilize the person. Can a person who has anorexia, can their heart stop? What do you think? Can their heart just stop? What'd you say, Jose? Yes. That's true. They can. Their heart can just stop because look, they have an extreme electrolyte imbalance. All can be off and potassium is most often the one that's off, which potassium we know affects the heart, right? And so um, you're often going to have to put them in the ICU. This person who is anorexic weighs below 75% of their ideal body weight, and they have less than 10% body fat. So that's important. Um, if you look here, daytime heart rate, less than 50 beats per minute. I know you guys don't know much about this yet because you will next semester, but that's a slow heart rate. The blood flow is not making it around the body to feed the organs. Their systolic pressure is low. Their temperature is usually low. 
and they have the heart arrhythmia is probably because their potassium is low. So what we're going to do is we're going to stabilize the patient. That's one of the things we're going to do. Now, we have to be really worried, and this might be an important fact, okay? Have you ever, have you guys ever watched Survivor? Like years ago, I don't know. Have you watched Survivor? Maybe. Yeah, I probably don't have time to watch Survivor in nursing school. But if you have watched Survivor, you would know years ago what they did is they only gave them rice. Like they only, they had to earn rice, and then if they didn't get it, they didn't have anything. Well, here's the problem with that. This is called refeeding syndrome. So we often think that, oh, you know, if somebody's skinny, just feed them. But there is something that happens uh, that can cause them to die as they start to re-eat. Okay. And we need to know that. Um, and so as the person, and I don't know if you are aware, but like on Survivor, if they haven't eaten for a while, and then they go and say, you won the challenge, you got this hamburger and all this cake and whatever, and they start eating. And then the next thing you, you probably don't see is they get sick uh, because they get this refeeding syndrome. And what it is, is it's fluid balance abnormalities. Your glucose starts to become abnormal and your phosphorus drops, your magnesium drops, your potassium drops, and you have thiamine deficiency, which means your B vitamin drops and it can be lethal. Okay. So when we start to refeed someone, we do it really slow. And sometimes we might have to do it through, you know, TPN. We may have to do it that way, right? So interventions, let's look and see what we're going to do for this person. And if you do not have this sheet, I will send it to you. We can look at the other sheet also. But I want you to see the first thing is medical. Um, we're going to get them their medical help they need. We need to worry about their environment and look. There is really no drug approved for anorexia. So what we're going to do is after we achieve the weight we set for them or they set with us, then they can have Prozac, which is an SSRI after they have achieved their weight, right? Um, there's some complementary things we can do to help this person, which would be like massage, acupuncture, yoga, those things. We can educate them on how to make good choices. Um, talk about eating conversations shouldn't be centered on food right but we can have healthy eating uh, education and disease education um, our goal okay now this is important a goal for an anorexic is to achieve 90 percent ideal body weight all right acknowledge emotional physical difficulty of experience so we want to acknowledge that they do have obsessive thoughts and compulsions not to eat and they need to control because they're perfectionists. This is a difficult, this is, this is difficult for the patient that they cannot just give it up. So we have to acknowledge that they have this. Now, when you are dealing with an anorexic, it's really important to know how to weigh the patient, right? Because I mean, you got to weigh the patient. So what it says here is weigh daily times one week, then three times a week in like sports bra and shorts, same time every day before any intake. So we want to weigh them in the same clothes. But first, the first week you're going to weigh daily and then the, the then three times a week after that. Um, this is an acceptable weight gain, two to three pounds. Because of refeeding syndrome, we don't want them to just gain like 10 pounds. That might harm them. Uh, do not negotiate weight or reweigh the patient. That's a big thing. You are the mental health nurse. They, if they say, no, I don't weigh that much or reweigh me, I want to see it. Nope. We just, we take the weight. The patient may or may not look at the scale. It depends. So sometimes they weigh the patient backwards, but sometimes they weigh the patient looking at the scale. Um, we want the meal times to be pleasant, calm, uh, specific times, maybe set a time we're going to sit and eat. And this is very important. When you're dealing with an anorexic, you want to observe the patient while they're eating and for one hour after. Okay. So we observe them to prevent them from hiding food while they're eating. And for one hour after that's very specific. And I want you to remember that, um, because it's different for bulimia. Okay. So now we're going to go to bulimia and then we'll go look at the other notes here too and make sure you, you know. Um, 
when they say DSM-5 criteria, what they mean is like, this is the criteria that we use to diagnose them as a bulimic or as whatever disease they have, right? It's a mental health diagnosis tool. And so this person would have recurrent episodes of binge eating, which you know is, I think everybody knows what bulimia is, but we've got to get specific on this test. So eating an amount of food that is definitely larger than what most individuals would eat in a similar period, and they have a lack of sense of control over our overeating, okay? So they can't control it. And what happens is they feel guilt after they eat. So it says reoccurring inappropriate compensatory behavior to prevent weight gain, they will uh, self-induce vomiting. They feel guilt. And I want you to remember bulimics, when they eat a ton of food, then all of a sudden this guilt weighs heavy on them and then they have to go and vomit. So they tend to misuse laxatives and diuretics and other meds, fasting and excessive exercise too. But just know they induce vomiting because of the guilt that they have, okay? And let's look at some comorbidities. They might have some mood disorders, anxiety, maybe some uh, borderline uh, issues like substance uses. I don't think you have to remember all of that. You have to know what is going on with the patient right here. And then serotonin, the brain structure, uh, they may have a little bit of increased gray matter, childhood abuse, low self-esteem, uh, anxiety, impulse control. Uh, they have issues, maybe ADHD. These would all play a role in a person having bulimia. But we're gonna look, we're gonna look at what's the difference. And when you're looking at bulimia, you gotta compare it to anorexia because you've got to pick out what's different in order to answer the question. So we know binge eating, right? We know that. We know self-induced vomiting and they tend to use laxatives and diuretics. When I we had a when I worked at a G office, we had a young girl. We she she was young and she wasn't like super super skinny, but um she uh we went in to scope her for a colonoscopy and her her colon was black. And what she had done is there's a laxative called Sinecot. And it, when you use it for a very long time, it will turn the colon black. And so the doctor was really straightforward with her when he came out and said, you're using laxatives. She said, no, I'm not. And he says, yeah, we, you are. We saw it. And so um, a history of anorexia in a third of the individuals. So sometimes they'll be anorexic and then they'll go over to being bulimic. All right. They tend to have some depression. And they have some problems, impulse, impulse problems is one of the things, and anxiety. Uh, they might possibly want to commit suicide, and they may have other impulses, low self-esteem, stealing. But let's look at what the physical finding would be. Now, remember, we're going to keep purging or throwing up with this disease. I know anorexics can also do it. So if we purge a lot or throw up, we're going to erode the teeth, right? That stomach acid, as it comes up, is going to erode the teeth. So they may have some teeth erosion. They might have some gum disease. They might have some, not tooth decay, but tooth decay. So the dentist may be the first person to recognize that this person is a bulimic, okay? They might have a chronic sore throat or indigestion or heartburn because they're having that stomach acid constantly coming up. They may even, and I worked in a GI field, have a rupture of the esophagus because of their vomiting so much. They also can have a slow heart rate, cardiac arrest, heart failure, because their levels are off also. They may have some stomach ulcers, pain, stomach rupture, constipation. They may also have some painful periods or uh, no period at all, right? Now, this is a really important fact. This is called a Russell sign. Have y'all had this in class yet? Have y'all done bulimia or anorexia? No, y'all probably, I, I just, here. So what I want you to do is when you're going over this with your instructor, which is, this is going to be handy for you. Pay attention to the things that she points out if she points them out. But this calluses on the knuckle is called a Russell sign. And what it is, is the, the patient is constantly sticking their finger down their throat 
and it's going to cause a little uh, kind of an ulcer or a sore on their knuckles of the finger that they're sticking down their throat. And that's called a Russell sign. All right. They are also going to have electrolyte imbalances. But here's the thing. They don't always look skinny. They look normal weight. OK, so remember, a bulimic is going to look normal weight. They overeat and then they feel guilt and then they purge. All right. That's their problem. And one other thing about rupture of the esophagus up here that I wanted to point out is once their finger quits working and they quit, you know, and they're sticking their finger down to throw up, then they'll tend to get other things like spoons and knives and things trying to stimulate their gag reflex. And they could have a rupture of their esophagus. All right. So let's look at what we might see criteria for hospitalization for a bulimic would be their potassium levels too low or their chloride levels too low, or they have an esophageal tear or an arrhythmia, or maybe they just keep vomiting and they can't, because they've used their gag reflex so much, maybe they just can't quit vomiting. That would be uh, the reasons to put them in the hospital. Syncope is fainting. And also you would see that with the electrolyte imbalance, right? So let's just look here. It says, I just know if I could only lose a few pounds, everything in my life would fall into place. Uh, not to, oh, well, this is not a very good picture here. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to have that on there. Um, but bulimia, let's look here, is um, this is what they do. Sometimes they'll have a strict diet. They'll slip up. They'll feel bad. They'll binge. They'll purge. And then they do a strict diet again. But usually these patients are not super skinny. You can't tell that they have bulimia. The dentist might be the first one to know. And then they, you might be able to recognize the Russell sign on their hand. Um, cognitive behavior, normalized eating habits. These are things we're going to work on with the patient. But antidepressant. Now let's look. It says Prozac. Did you notice Prozac for both of these? But this is another drug, Topamax here helps with binge binging suppression it helps control their binging and then y'all remember y'all's tcas uncle elleville amitriptyline suppresses binge eating and vomiting so if you notice with a binge eater or um, bulimic we might add a few other meds here okay what are we going to teach them we're going to teach them about the eating disorder about meal planning about relaxation coping uh, emotional effects of binging and perching, and then what's happening in their life, right? They're probably going to need some counseling. I think both, uh, both of them are going to need counseling. And we're going to assist with some underlying anxiety that they are self-loathing their self. They don't like their self, right? Because they're like, I wish I was skinnier. I wish this for some reason. And it turns into a disorder. OK, so here's the thing with this. Remember when we did when we said um, anorexia, we said we observe them when they're eating and we observe one hour after meals. These are we're going to observe. It says during and after meals on this, but we're going to observe them after their meals. OK, because they one to two, I think it's two to three up to two to three hours after their meals because they will get up and purge. And they're going to purge it. Sometimes they hold it in for a little while. And then, um, so be aware. We'll, we'll look at the other one just to, so you can see. I think it's a little better for this one. So what is, uh, so we know anorexia. We know bulimia, bulimia, right? But binge eating. Now, if you've ever seen My Thousand Pound Life or whatever that show is on TV, what happens is these people binge eat. They like you know, seven, eight hamburgers, whatever. They usually sit in their car and they eat, but they don't purge. They don't purge. So binge eating episodes associated with three plus of the following, eating much more rapidly than normal, eating until feeling uncomfortably full, eating large amounts of food when not feeling physically hungry, eating alone. Remember I said they eat in their car because they're embarrassed of how much they're eating. They know they're eating a lot feeling disgusted with their self, depressed or very guilty afterwards. But it says, um, is not associated with a reoccurrent use of inappropriate compens uh, compensatory behavior. So they don't throw up, they don't go exercise. Um, 
Binge eating is the most common disorder. And it says patient may go from normal to, you know, obese, extremely obese, right? Some things that the patient may have that's underlying in their life would be anxiety or substance use or bipolar, maybe. Uh, sometimes a binge eating disorder, I don't know if you've seen My Thousand Pound Life, but it runs in the family. So a lot of times it runs in families, maybe some low self-esteem, maybe they have body dissatisfaction using food to help cope. Now here, I'm going to say something right here that most people, if you see they're overweight, they are just unhappy, maybe because of they have had a trauma in their life and food helps them cope. For some reason, it, it helps them cope. So when we look, binge eating disorder, uh, we're going to assess a lot of things. We're going to assess their nutritional pattern and we're going to assess their history of weight cycling. They're going to lose and gain, lose and gain. I don't know if you've ever seen that show, but they go to the doctor and they say, I lost a little bit, but then I gained it and I lost. And they'll do well for a couple of months and then they'll binge and they'll gain a significant amount of weight and then they'll lose weight. And so it's more like a yo-yo diet type of thing. And so uh, we want to know what their triggers and their foods are. And, you know, sometimes what they'll do is they'll have like their counselor goes into their fridge and says, we're going to throw this out, throw this out, throw this out. And they're like, what? Um, they do have low self-esteem. Sometimes they'll have sleep apnea because they're obese. Okay. They might have high blood pressure. They might have high cholesterol, stroke, heart attack, even gallbladder disease because they're eating a high amount of foods uh, that are fatty. And then type 2 diabetes. So a binge eater might have some of these problems and they might have chronic kidney problems too with kidney failure. And even now, why would they have osteoarthritis? What, what would cause that? Anybody? Look right here, weight on the bones because they're so heavy. They're gonna now suffer from osteoarthritis. So what can we do? Let's look here, what we're gonna do. We've got... SSRIs, Prozac. Wow, Prozac is super helpful with an eating disorder. Uh, it helps while they're on it, but they'll but they'll gain the weight back when they stop Prozac. So it kind of helps, you know, the brain um, stop. I, I I don't know exactly, but the SSRI, the serotonin, helps control their behavior. Now this one is different for a binge binge eater, Vanvase. Okay. This is a CNS stimulant and it helps treat attention deficit disorder, but it also helps with pinging and it can be misused. It's not the first line treatment, but it can be used for binge eaters. Uh, Off-label, we can uh, express that type binge eating associated with obesity, cause, meds cause weight loss. I don't know, don't worry about that one. Um, most of the people who are binge eaters will seek bariatric surgery. And so complications could be, you know, urinary incontinence, increased triglycerides, impaired fasting glucose levels, um, and then the increased risk for complication. Patient needs to get counseling and psychotherapy. So here's, here's my thought on bariatric surgery. Um, the person's generally very unhealthy, and if they don't change something in their life, then they're going to die, right, because they're so heavy. And so if you've ever seen the thousand pound lot, they recommend bariatric surgery, but the doctor usually won't give it to them until they learn to control their eating. Because if they don't learn to control their eating and they have the surgery, they're going to gain weight again. It's not going to be a super fix, right? And so what we need to do is the patient usually gets psychotherapy, some counseling. And I think in the real world, they've now made people get like three sessions of therapy, uh, before they will even go to bariatric surgery. So we need cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, here's the thing about this. Keep a journal, identify triggers, identify foods that trigger it, identify the time of day that triggers it, or maybe even what triggers it. They need to plan their meals out and their snacks ahead of time. They can't just go and drive up to McDonald's because they're going to not do good. And they need small, frequent, healthy meals. So we have three types of disorders. So what I'm going to do now, let me go to the to the one that you know, 
let me go here. I think this is, hold on just a second here. This is the one that you're familiar with and I was just on that one. So let me go down to what we need to look at on binging. Okay, this one I do like because if you notice here, anorexia and bulimia are side by side, okay? We wanna know, and if you look here, Everything is almost exactly the same until you get down to what? Let's see. Review signs and symptoms and appearance. Get a psychosocial nutritional pattern, binging and purging. On the bulimic side, it's the binging and purging. The electrolyte levels, the glucose levels, the thyroid, everything is similar. I'm going to look back one step here and I want to show you something. Remember how we said we can't make them gain a lot of weight really quickly or just start feeding them hamburgers? Uh, I want to show you what refeeding syndrome does. It says uh, prolonged starvation of the body switches from glucose-based energy to fat and protein-based energy. When nutrients are actually restored to the body, insulin stimulates glucagon, glucagon fat and protein synthesis and a process that requires minerals such as phosphate and magnesium. Refeeding, and sin refeeding syndrome may occur, which is potentially lethal, which will result in a fluid balance abnormality, abnormal glucose metabolism. Okay, be aware of these three deficiencies, hypophosphatemia, hypomagnesium, and hypokalemia. So this is, so everything's low and you know what, when we start eating, everything's just going to go crazy. So reintroduction of nutrients must be proceeded slowly to avoid refeeding syndrome. That's a very important fact. Okay. Now, when you get down to the anorexia, let's go over this one more time with the notes that we had. I want you just to see that they are afraid of gaining weight or becoming fat. All right. And it says persistent energy restrict intake restriction leading to significantly low body weight. Now, when we come down here, um, it says they have, we think they have some altered serotonin. Maybe that's why Prozac works really well. Uh, maybe they have had an illness in the past that caused them to lose weight, like the flu. And then someone said, wow, you look really good. And then that keeps them kind of thinking, hey, if I'm skinny, I'm going to look good. And it gives them this little disorder. So when we look here, terror of gaining weight, we said that they're absolutely afraid of it. They are preoccupied with food, even though you wouldn't think. And then they view their self as fat. Okay. Look how they handle their food, how they push their pieces around their plate. And know that this vomiting and laxatives, let's keep it with bulimia, okay? But they rigorously exercise. Now, if we go down here, this is a little different view. It just shows you what's happening in the brain, the hair, the heart, the blood. And so if you look, it says preoccupation with food and calories, fear of gaining weight, headaches, fainting, dizziness. Just read through these. It's going to be important. Lanugo is important for an anorexia. I think they will ask about that. Um, they get brittle hair, skin, and nails, but Lanugo on the body, that fine hair. And then um, look, their heart, that potassium effect. Low iron, they might be anemic. They might suffer from constipation. They might have problems with fertility because they might lose their time of the month if they're female. Uh, dehydration can cause kidney failure and then loss of bone calcium and then muscle loss and fatigue. So when we look, this is a really good one. It says treatment. We're going to restore weight two to three pounds at a time, like at a week. And then Prozac after weight gain. I should put this on here after weight gain. So when we look, what a, there's no FDA drug of you know, approved, but fluoxetine or Prozac after the maintenance weight reached to reduce the OCD behavior. Remember, I'm going to back up here. They are perfectionist. Remember, I, it's here somewhere. I just don't say, oh, here it is right here. Perfectionism. An anorexic is a perfectionist. They may all have hand cytopenia. What is that? 
I'm going to ask you, do you remember what I said? They throw everything in the pan. There you go. What is that? What's, what are they throwing in there? Red? Uh, like their blood levels. Okay. Red, red blood, blood cells. White blood, blood cells. Yep. Yeah. All of them are in the pan, those three things. So they may have that. Now, make sure you know this is the drug of choice to help with the behavior. We want to restore their goal weight to 90% of their ideal body weight. And then you're going to, you've got to know how to weigh your patient on this test. Okay. You want to avoid refeeding syndrome. Do y'all remember the three electrolytes that are low in refeeding syndrome? Isn't it phosphorus, magnesium, and potassium. So make sure you, you remember that. Okay. Now we're just going to scroll down to uh, bulimia and we're going to look at, look at some risk factors. Uh, they could have childhood abuse, low self-esteem, ADH, poor self-esteem is usually the cause of, of having an eating disorder of bulimia. Now I want you to see they binge eat, right? But they feel so guilty that they do what? What do they do after they eat? Throw up. Mm -hmm. they, vomit. they throw up, they purge, right? Self-induced vomiting or maybe even laxatives and diuretics. Some of them even have a history of, anxiety, of anorexia. But remember that um, this, you're going to see some perforation. They could have esophageal perforation because maybe they're using their finger and then that doesn't work anymore. So then they get a fork or a spoon or a knife or something to stick down their throat, but they feel extreme shame and guilt after they vomit or well after vomiting, but I think they feel shame and guilt that they ate so much and then they vomit. So I'll look at Russell sign again. I would go through this and create your own notes on this. Make sure you know this patient's at risk for fainting, low potassium, low fluoride, and esophageal tears. If you were getting a patient in the hospital who was bulimic, these are some things you might see them for. An esophageal tear, an arrhythmia, uh, intractable vomiting or hem uh, hemoptysis. And then look at their teeth. Who's going to be the first person to decide if this, or to decide, not to decide, but to notice. It'd probably be the, yeah, the dentist. And if you look, it says mouth, erosion of dental enamel, swollen jaw, bad breath, gum disease, tooth decay. So that's a good sign that this person is purging. Okay. Now we got the medicines again. Make sure you know your Prozac and no topramate helps with binging. Remember TCA is also an amitriptyline is one. And it says topranil out to the side. That's, that's not amitriptyline. Amitriptyline is Elevil. But uh, Tofernil, maybe they mentioned that in class. When So when your instructor is uh, talking about it on a video, pay attention to the, the treatment of it, okay? And then we, of course, know what binging is. That's my thousand pound life where they binge and binge and then they actually are not getting rid of it, right? So they eat rapidly. They eat till they're uncomfortably full. Uh, they eat foods even when they're not hungry, and they're embarrassed and they eat by themselves and they feel disgusted and all of that. So make sure you know they tend to cycle their weight, lose a little bit, gain, lose a little bit, gain. And then the physical findings are really helpful on this one. Make sure you would know they might have some sleep apnea because of their weight gain and their airway and their throat and the gain in the neck area. Um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol is different than anorexia and bulimia and gallbladder disease, type 2 diabetes. I think these little things are going to be super important for your exam, okay? But just know, how are we going to treat this person? And I guess what? You guys are going to have it pretty simple because Prozac's the treatment, the first treatment. But do you think they're going to stay with Prozac? On some of these, they may say Topamax. I think it's Topramax on this one to suppress the appetite. Topramax is also on bulimia for appetite suppression right here, topramate. So be aware that uh, they can throw that one or a TCA at you for, for help on those ones. So pay attention. Now, I did a video earlier on the 
bipolar and schizophrenia. And we can go over that later after you watch the video and see. But I'm going to scroll down to, to the schizophrenia. And we're going to go down here. Um, let me, I didn't get all the way through. Through, but let me see what's left after this. The important thing in this is um, to know what you're looking at when you're seeing it. Okay, I'm gonna, I wanna mention these meds again. Um, when you have schizophrenia, okay. Now I might have got cut off on my other video, so I want you to be aware of these medications right here. Um, schizophrenia is going to be treated different than uh, bipolar. Bipolar is going to be lithium treatment and antipsychotics. These are going to be your first generation antipsychotics that are the old dogs. I call them the old dogs. Hal Halidol and Thorazine are the old dogs. They've been around since 19, I don't know, 50 something. And they're really good. They do help treat some of the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. So what I want you to do is watch the other video first and then go over these medicines on the second half. I know it's kind of backwards, but the problem with um, schizophrenia is that they produce too much dopamine. So these are dopamine antagonists and they target the positive symptoms. But if you'll remember, a schizophrenic has both positive and negative symptoms. So if we're only treating the positive, the person is still not getting treated correctly. So we want to know that these are the old dogs and they can cause EPS. Do you guys, are you familiar with EPS? Anybody know what that is? It's on the other video and you're going to watch it. But what I'm going to tell you is there's side effects to these medications that cause tardive dyskinesia, like head movement, tongue movement, pseudo Parkinson's, um, all sorts of things. And these, these medicines, these old dogs here tend to cause EPS, which is really not good. Um, so they do cause dry mouth. So you would teach your patient to chew gum, sugar-free gum or increase their fiber and their fluids. Those would be important things when you see this. The second generation are better. Okay, these drugs are new. These are now, do you see the first line treatment? The If this doesn't work, we may have to go to Hal and Thor, but the Hal and Thor still work. It's just that they only treat the positive. So we want something that the patient's going to get the full, full whammy. And so let's do these, the first line, clozapine, risperidone, olanzapine. These are all the drugs that are considered uh, second generation, but they're now the first line treatment because they treat both positive and negative symptoms, okay? Look, minimal to no EPS. That's what we want, right? Um, and we can go over that. Some disadvantages are... Uh, you'll see on my other video, metabolic syndrome. So here's the problem, that these medicines can cause obesity. They can cause high lipids. They can cause hyper sugar, hyper sugar hyperglycemia, and they can cause insulin resistance. So the patient's going to gain weight, okay? Now I want you to pay attention to this because I think there might be a test question what I'm about to say. If you want to treat a patient and they don't want to gain weight, this one, Abilify, does not cause the patient to gain weight. I don't know about you, but even if I had schizophrenia, I wouldn't want to gain weight, right? Nobody's going to take their medicine if that's the side effect. So Abilify is a new drug. It is also a dopamine stabilizer and it reduces dopamine and increases dopamine in some areas. So it kind of evens out the dopamine. So this is now the third generation, although they're going to start you on the first line. Um, it improves both positive and neg negative. Little risk for EPS and tardive dyskinesia, lower risk for weight gain, and a few little anticholinergic effects. Hmm. If you were to get a question that said, which one would keep you from gaining weight? I think you better know the answer right here. Abilify. 
prazolol, right? So uh, make sure you know that one. These drugs are all going to be used to treat schizophrenia. And I will go over and probably make a really, really good video for this, okay? I might try to even do it like I did for uh, MedSearch on all of it. But for right now, this is going to help you. So what you're going to do is if you are if you go down this column and you see this one, second generation is gain weight, look what it says here. You're going to teach how to minimize weight gain, teach about nutrition, physical activity, teach the importance of routine preventative med medical visits, cholesterol, triglyceride checks, and fasting blood glucose. I don't know. If I had to choose one, I'd choose this generation three because I don't want to gain weight, right? So um, I think that is pretty much all that we went through. And what I'm going to do is I want to pick out some important things and see here. I want to back up uh, one of the, on the video that I did this, I want you to see, okay, let me go here. I'm going to just kind of review schizophrenia for just a minute, even though you're going to see it on the other video. Okay. Schizophrenia happens in usually males and it happens usually at the onset of 15 to 25 years old. So what will happen is this person may appear normal until they're about 15, and all of a sudden they may have some brain changes. The problem with schizophrenia is that they produce too much dopamine is what they're finding out. And so we know that what will start to happen to the patient is they'll have delusions, hallucinations, and disorganized speech. So they may even have some uh, grossly disorganized catatonic behavior and negative symptoms. And you'll see that in the other video. What I want to show you is how important some of these things are. And this makes a good picture on this one, okay? So a lot of times, because they have the delusions, hallucinations, They'll seek other substances like alcohol or weed to numb what they're feeling. They'll have depression and suicide, and it says 20% attempt, 5 to 10% succeed. So maybe somebody who's trying to kill themselves may have this disease. Agnosia means they're unable to recognize that they have a problem. And so what happens with the schizophrenic is they quit taking their meds. And you'll see that when I talked about it in the other one. The big thing here is you worry about low salt in a lot of these diseases because low salt, and I don't know if y'all remember me talking about it, uh, can cause intracranial pressure. So when your salt is low in your body and your bloodstream, excuse me, then you will have a fluid shift into your cell. And the cells in the brain can only swell so much. And that might, what might be why you have confusion, delirium, disorientation, and restlessness. Okay. A lot of them are smokers and a lot of them have anxiety. So there's like a, a group of things that you might see here. Uh, they're trying to figure out 80% of this is genetic. And they've come up with the dopamine theory that there's too much dopamine. Um, so one of the things I wanted to point out is that with a schizophrenic, and you're gonna see this on the other video, but I didn't have this nice little box here. Yeah. This is like a visual to help you remember. Positive symptoms are hallucinations, delusion, delusions, disorganized speech, and bizarre behavior. I was just telling the girls earlier that I think of a schizophrenic patient as like a homeless person walking down the street, talking to themselves, having hallucinations and delusions. Those are the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. All right. The negative symptoms right here are very important for you to understand. They all start with the letter A. And so what they do is they subtract from the personality, which is they look more like depression. And um, I will send you the sheet that explains all of these words, but they all start with the letter A. So we have positive, we have negative symptoms in a schizophrenic patient. Um, these symptoms right here, can you imagine trying to go to work and you're having hallucinations and delusions? Uh, it affects their ability to work. It affects their ability to care um, for their self uh, and social life and their quality of life in general. So this person also has some cognitive symptoms and affective symptoms. 
and they may have some thinking impairment, mm -hmm. um, which means like they might look like they have attention deficit. They might have poor problem solving. They might make poor decisions or they might have just impaired judgment. And that would be cognitive symptoms. The effective symptoms would be like suicide and hopelessness. So this is a very good picture to help you get an idea of what a schizophrenic is going through. Okay. And so when you look at your notes and you will see, I'll talk more about this later, but make sure you know, uh, you're going to rule out, do they have any medical problem? Are they on any medicine that could cause this? Uh, are they abusing drugs or alcohol? What is their mental status? Are they having hallucinations? What, when did they begin? Are they at risk for suicide? We're going to check all of these things, right? Do, are they taking their meds? Are they getting adequate sleep and rest? Are they, uh, you know, what's going on? And I really give you a good review in this first one. So, um, but when you get down here, we've got different phases of schizophrenia. So I want you to be aware that on your notes, you have an acute phase, a stabilization phase, and then a relapse prevention phase. Okay. Um, also, uh, when you're looking here, how do you communicate with someone who's having hallucinations and delusions? This is going to be important for your test. Uh, look, these are the things like ask the patient to describe his beliefs. Tell me more about validate if part of the delusion yes the doctor's here but because they they have delusions like he's trying to kill me yeah yes the doctor's here but he's not trying to kill you so you want to be honest mm -hmm. so go through and i will go i'll see if i can make a, a better video that will help you go through some of these that will help you uh, be more successful in the test so be aware that uh, me, some of these patients don't Actually, schizophrenics don't think they have a problem. It's called agnosia. And so they might cheek their medication. They might put it in their palm and then get rid of it afterwards. So seek to switch medication to a more difficult to conceal from such a liquid or fast dissolving tablet. Um, we, we don't want them to be able to conceal their meds. Here in your notes, agnosia is talking about schizophrenics and what you would see with schizophrenia. And then we just went over these medications. We have to know these are the, the kinds of medicines that this patient is going to be on for schizophrenia and what are they going to treat and what are you going to watch for? So the first video I did will help with that. Um, one of the things that I'm going to encourage you to do, okay, and how far have you gotten in mental health so far? Like what have you covered so far in mental health? Let me see if I can find the... Um, what, what have y'all covered? Have y'all covered legal and ethical? So far? Or do you know? Anybody? Okay. Hmm. Okay. So we, so whatever you haven't covered, if we covered it here, make sure when you go into or whatever you watch her video, that you write some important facts. So here's, here's my thought. I'm just going to give you a thought here as you're looking through this. Um, you have to know informal versus voluntary admission. You have to know that. You have to know what an involuntary admission is. What's the process? What can, you know, who can do it and, and what can happen there? My internet says it's unstable. Um, remember, treatment can only be given if the patient provides consent. Um, and then make sure, so what I would do is I would, write out the facts on a page for myself, even though they're listed here really nicely, that's not going to help you when you remember or help you to remember. So let's see, we haven't started module three, so we have been over. Ooh, very good. Okay, this will be super helpful. So these two videos that I made today will help you get in the thought process, and then I'll try to make some more detailed, like, shorter videos on just some certain things that are a little bit more organized than happened today. So, but uh, we're going to deal with some legal ethical things from the beginning, like, because you have to know, is it legal to restrain somebody? Is it legal to do this? Can you give a medicine to sedate them? What do you, what can you do? What can't you do? 
Um, I am going to send you, <clears throat> I'm going to send you, sorry, I'm losing my voice, um, this page also. This is the other one. And do you see how it's written out really different? And autonomy, benefiance, justice, veracity, fidelity, non-malfiance, print both of those um, <clears throat> things that I give you. I think this one walks down the blueprint. I was going to try to pull the blueprint up here, but look, voluntary versus informal uh, and involuntary omission. And then we've got, what are the patients right? Can they refuse treatment? Restraint. Um, this is why this one is pretty good. Confidentiality, duty to warn, uh, child abuse, and then the key terms. This is where I wanted to go with this to show you. You have to know these key terms in order to answer the question. And I went over them in the first video this morning. So I had some students that needed help and they were here in Amarillo. So I just did a little video while we were talking. Intentional torts versus unintentional torts. We talked about that. Okay. And then what we did is we went into bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. So I just want you to know, we did do bipolar and schizophrenia, so it's going to give you an idea of what you're looking at. And I like this one a little better because it gives you a little idea of either they are manic and they have elevated mood or maybe irritable, or they have uh, the manic symptoms or they have the depressive symptoms symptoms and I'll show you and you can look, watch the video and then she gives you a little acronym here how to remember it this is very long it took me like an hour and a half to to go through it all in detail so what I did earlier this morning is going to help you and then I went over what lithium is what to watch for and the other mood stabilizers I also went over um, well I thought I went over and I thought they had it here Oh, this is bipolar. When we get down to schizophrenia, because see, they're, they're not right next to each other. Um, and so I decided to make bipolar and schizophrenia right next to each other on the video. When you get down to here, let me show you something. This will help you with EPS. And I, I know this is a lot longer, isn't it? Let me go. Talk, sorry about all the scrolling. See how long it was? When you get to, this is what EPS is pseudo parkinsonism so they look like they have parkinson's acute dystonia is facial grimacing like maybe upward eye movement spasms of the tongue face and neck we really worry about airway here because they have laryngeal spasms and it could constrict their airway hard eye dyskinesia is where they have a protrusion of the tongue and they have lip smacking they smack their lips a lot and they have a chewing motion and akathasia where they're restless and they're tapping their foot these can all be considered eps symptoms okay and those are from those medicines like halidol and thor um, and thorazine the old dogs and even some of the second generations and the third generation can cause those so we got to know about them and then i talked about hal and thor in a different view here i talked about eps and then I talked about second generation and metabolic syndrome. These are all test questions. If you start now and you start looking at them and walking your mind around them, they're going to help you. Now, I want you to see something, okay? So we're going to go to Evolve. And I know you've seen this before, but I'm going to show you again, okay? That I'm going to show you where to find these types of questions. So we're going to go here. And if you don't have it, you can always send me and I will give you the code. But what I want to show you is these mental health questions and where to find for this section. And it might be helpful to go ahead as you study each section, go here and then try to see if you can answer the questions. OK, mm -hmm. so if we look here, we have hang on just a second eating disorders. So after you study anorexia and bulimia, I want you to go and click on eating disorders, test yourself, see how well you know it, okay? Then we have some mood disorders. I'm not sure if that falls under um, schizophrenia or bulimia. Let me see. Here's schizophrenia all by itself. And bipolar. I bet mood disorders is the bipolar. Okay, so mood disorders might be bipolar, 
and then schizophrenia is over here by itself right here after you study each section be able to look at it then go to therapeutic communication and see how do you therapeutically talk to a schizophrenic or a bipolar patient that will be helpful now earlier i was here let me see if i can find it and i'm going to show you uh, let me see my bookmarks because i bookmarked it and i went all the way down i've got like a jillion of them um well we're going to do it again i'm just going to show you how to get to it so you could say nurses labs questions on bipolar disorder if you type that in it will send you to this page and what you should do is go to mental health and psychiatric nursing practice questions okay now do not download anything on this it looks like it says continue don't click on that it's a trick uh, but keep scrolling down and look all the practice questions now i want you to see psychiatric meds these are all practice questions look at you got a schizophrenia mm, you're going to need to know those and personality disorders is your next test substance abuse is your next test but we might even do some anxiety disorders because you know that uh, maybe anorexia and bulimia are or if you if there's no anorexia and bulimia in this you could put nurses labs questions on anorexia let's see this nurses labs question Ooh, sorry questions i'm not even sure how to spell let's see here see what it brings us to Ooh, look eating disorders so then you can go down remember don't download anything it tells you what eating disorders are let's see if it gives you any practice questions up here hmm but there should be some maybe down here maybe it's all included in that one um but it just talks about eating disorders. I would say sometimes they do practice questions at the end, but for this one, they don't have it specifically. So it's probably listed under that first nurses labs with um, with the, what we saw earlier, this one right here, whatever that was one. Uh, let me go back a, a notch so that you can see it again. Um, and if you look, you can pause your video. And even if you had to, you can put in that, code in fact what i may do is i may copy it and i may paste it onto a, a word document and then i will send you the link okay because that might be more helpful to you instead of trying to find it so let me put it on here and i will send you this link um so what i would encourage you today as i'm going to download these videos and i'm sorry we started late and my computer shut down but since your test isn't till like november you've got plenty of time to get this together and and under control uh, for yourself when you are studying i want you to pull out and here's my last little spiel okay i want you to pull out your um let me go here just a second i know i've got a million things here but i'm going to do this you've got module three let's see what we've got here that's this we don't want that one we want the blueprint here it is right there yay who would have guessed and i want you to walk down the blueprint and make sure that you look at all of this look at our ethical principles look at our patients rights can they refuse treatment what do we know because this is like legal stuff when you get into this field you got to know can i restrain them can i do this and then we're going to look at eating disorders go through those just like we did and then go through bipolar and look at the medications and look at what you're seeing here walk it down with the video and then look at your schizophrenic disorders okay and then all of the um, different nursing process there and that's pretty much your test okay so if you can get this down and that video that i made was long this morning um, then it's going to be super helpful but what we went over 10 to 12 questions of your test is going to come from that and then look bipolar 8 to 10 and then schizophrenia whoa 20 to 22 questions tells me you better know what we're looking at right here look at the terms 
be able to recognize the term. If you don't know the term, then you're probably not going to do good. So we'll see if we can make it a little bit more organized, um, detailed video. Okay. Are y'all still there? I'm, I'm just talking my head off. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, is there anything that you need me to go over?